So are you keeping up okay with the course? Yeah? Not too difficult? Nothing difficult, right? Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyanantana Shalakaya Chaksur Minitandena Tasme Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shanyavari Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavan Nebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadanta Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our ongoing study of the Nectar of Devotion. So this is class number three. Revision. The objective of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. The objective. Vrindavan Krishna, Akila Rasamrita Murti. Krishna is the source of all rasas. All the rasas are found in Krishna. How many rasas are there? Twelve. How many primary? Mm. Okay. You have you only have to you have to learn the names of these different rasas. Presented an overview of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, specifically Purva Vibhak. Purva Vibhak. That was the the first section, the northern section of the ocean, four sections, north, south, east and west. And within each section there are waves, right? What's the word for wave, remember? Waves? Laharis. 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 Right. And there are four waves in our first section which we're studying. So then the definition of pure devotional service reference to Swarupa and Tatasta Lakshana. Swarupa meaning? And Tatasta? Marginal. So, what's an example devotional service which is pure? Give an example pure devotional service from the examples we had yesterday. Do you remember one? Describing pure devotional service. Huh? Prahlad Maharaj? No, from those, you remember we did the exercise, you had to identify what was pure devotional service and what was not. Yes? You can accept maintenance for his family, right? He's doing teaching. Okay. Yeah? It's working? It's working outside. Well, I don't know that's so pure devotional service. It's, been, it's just on the family. It's very bodily conscious. I don't know where Krishna comes in. <laughs> you know, it just maintains his family. Huh? Cultivation of devotees. In the family. <laughs> well, the family are all devotees, right? I'm not so sure that's a good example of pure devotional service. There were better ones. 
Yes. Marriage is You have a child who is a pure devotee. Right. Right. And there was the other example about somebody who's fasting on a courtesy to get a son, and we said that's not pure devotee. Why not? What's the difference? Yeah, material desire. Right. Yeah. What's wrong with girls? You know, why you have to have a son? Is there some big difference between men and women? He wants a son, doesn't want a girl. What's wrong? What's wrong with girls, you know? The plan is to have a child. And Krishna gives you a girl or a boy, whatever, you know. They're the bodies, right? Yeah? And doing austerity on a courtesy, a courtesy is for Krishna's pleasure, right? Devotional service is something done for Krishna, not for your material desire. Also, right. And so you're fasting on the courtesy. We do it for, for the pleasure of Krishna, not to satisfy our material desire. And the desire to have a child is a material desire. But the desire to have a child who's a devotee and you do garbage and samskar, that's a different thing. That is, you know, that, that's nothing to do with ekadasi. Ekadasi is a day which is meant for Krishna. You don't do garbhadhyan samskara on ekadasi. Right? Ekadasi is a holy day. It's a day for Krishna to increase your remembrance of Krishna, hearing and chanting. So you don't do garbhadhyan samskara on the ekadasi. You have to pick another day. That's an, another point. Okay? Yeah? Any other examples? Pure and mixed devotion? Yes, okay, good. And mixed devotee, mixed devotion? Taking 10%. Yeah. Now sometimes, you know, sometimes some temples, you know, they they invite people come and make life members and we give you a percentage because they, they, they need people to go out and cultivate. But not that they sit in the temple. If you sit in the temple and take money and take a percentage of money which people bring to the temple, that's not so good. But if you're going out, you go out into the streets and you go around and you meet people and then you cultivate some. That's your, you know, your own work. You're doing some work yourself. Okay, okay it's going to take 10%. It's still not pure devotion, but it's, it's a lot better than somebody who sits in the temple. Because the temple is Krishna's temple. It's Krishna's the temple, you know. And people come there to the temple with the intention of giving. You didn't do anything, you're just sitting there. <laughs> so why you should get 10%? Right? But if you're going out, you're going out for making life number. Some places they need people to go around and cultivate congregation, cultivate people, make members. And they're bringing money to the temple, so they get something. Some people are good at making life members. And if they don't get that encouragement, they won't do it. <laughs> so it's, it's a fruitive mentality. So it's mixed devotion. Okay? Any questions? No? Bengali people. <laughs> right? Okay, let's see. How can we practice Uttama Bhakti? So how do you practice Sadhana Bhakti? Yeah. How do you practice Uttama Bhakti? Uh 
Constantly in favor of Krishna. How do you endeavor for Krishna? What do you do? Well, I should hope you follow the four regulative principles, but that's not Uttama Bhakti. It's Bhakti, but how, well, it may not be Bhakti. Some people may follow four principles, may not be Bhakti, may not be devotees. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Huh? There was an example where Prabhupada uh, mentioned to some disciples and take the permission of me to make anything. So you take permission from the Guru to do what? To, as Krishna What is Uttama Bhakti? Shravanam Kirtan Vishnu, Smaranam, Padasevanam, Archanam, Vandam, Dashyam, Sakyam, Atmani Vedanam. These nine angas, this is, this is what is uttama bhakti, when you do uttama bhakti. But, of course, you have to do it constantly, right? Remember, anyavila sita sunyam, jnana karma jana vritam, anu kuyena means favorable, anu kuyena krishna, for Krishna, Shilanam. Shilanam means activities. And the activities have to be constant, has to be continuous. So you engage in devotional service continuously. You don't, you know, no days off, no holidays, no day off for Kali Puja. Oh, we're doing Dur Durga Puja today, we have to go to the Durga temple today, we have to go and worship Durga. No, every day is for Krishna, right? Okay. Well, lesson three, six characteristics of pure devotional service, part one. So this is from the first chapter of nectar of devotion. Yes, Goswami has to come, right? You all know that now? We chanted that. Six characteristics. So he begins, this is a verse from the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu about klesh, klesh agni, klesha. Klesha, do you, have you heard this word klesha before? What's it mean? Miseries. Huh? Misery. Misery, right. Troubles, distress. The Adi Atmic Klesha, Adi Baltic Klesha, Adi Daivic Klesha. So Klesha means a lot of trouble, a lot of difficulty. In the uh, 12th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna also describes the impersonal path as being klesha, a lot of trouble. So many difficulties. So klesha, klesha gni subhada moksha, laguta krit sedur laba, sandrananda vishesh atma, shri krishna karshani cha sa. So we'll meet these words today. If not today, then certainly tomorrow. But these, are, these words are describing the different characteristics of pure devotional service. Right? So we'll explain them as we come to them, one after, one after another. Don't worry just now. First of all, Klesha, Klesha Agni and Subhada. Kleshakni and Subhada. By the way, I have, I have uh, some, all these points which we're presenting to you on the slides, we have them all typed up as uh, notes on the class. So make sure Yagna has your email 
and we will send you all the list of the, the notes for each of the lessons. It will be easier for you to go through. You're taking notes yourself, but you may make some mistakes and you may miss something or something. So we'll, we'll send you the notes for each of the lessons. And it's helpful to read over the notes and to remember what we covered. Okay, so first one, Klesh Agni, and then Shubhada. Then Moksha Laguta Krit. Klesh Agni means relief from Klesha, relief from distress. And Shubhada, the beginning of all auspiciousness. Moksha Laguta Krit means surpasses even liberation. And then Sidur Laba means rarely achieved. Sandrananda Visheshatma meaning huh? puts one in transcendental happiness, the greatest transcendental happiness. And then Sri Krishna Karshini, the only means to attract Krishna. We're going to look at each of these six items. We'll look at them one after. But first we'll look at Klesh Agni. Pure devotional service brings immediate relief from all kinds of material distress. Right? Material distress. What, what are some symptoms of somebody in material distress? How can you understand somebody's suffering in the material world? Yes, Maharaji? Anxiety. But why, why are they in anxiety? Why are they in stress? What's the problem? So maybe you could say one of the results is economic problems, some kind of you know economic distress, no money, poor, poverty. That's one. That's one sign. Somebody is in uh, suffering, sinful reactions. Right? How do we recognize somebody suffering sinful reactions? One would be. You know, maybe poverty, they're very poor. What's another sign? Somebody... What? Oh, okay, not very good looking people. Yeah, very, maybe very un ugly, you see, yeah. Huh? Disease, yes, chronic disease. Born in a low family, degraded family, yes. Anything else? Uneducated. Yes. Uneducated, no education. Meeting some accidents. Facing some accident. The accident, maybe deformed, handicapped or something. Yeah, yeah and in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Kunt, Kunti says, Janma Aishwarya Shruta Shri. Right? People who are on the path of material progress. Material progress is based on these four things. Janma, the birth. People want good birth. Should be born in the high class family. Aishwarya, people want opulence, want money, want wealth. Shruta, people want education. They spend a lot of money on education put the children to school and then to college, education, and then Janma Aishwarya Shruta Shri, meaning beauty. People spend a lot of money to look beautiful. Beauty parlors, big business. So, sorry, this verse that you are saying is in Which verse? 
Huh? Which verse is this? Janma oh, Janma Aishwarya Shri, that's first canto, chapter 8, prayers by Queen Kunti. Prayers by Queen Kunti. Yeah. And she says, those who are on the path of material progress, then they won't know Krishna. They cannot know Krishna. So people who don't have these things, they're they're often in distress. It, 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 it's often it's the result of their sinful reactions. Why is somebody born in that condition or somebody's put into that condition? It's the re reactions from their past activities. So material distress. But devotional service brings relief from all kinds of material distress. Many people come to Krishna consciousness in distress. And Prabhupada saw that, especially when he was in USA. So many young people, Prabhupada was there in the USA in the 1960s and 70s. And there were a lot of people in distress. One reason they were in distress was they didn't want to go to Vietnam. The young men were supposed to go to army and fight in Vietnam. Many people didn't want to go and they were running away, hiding. And other people were in distress because they'd become drug addicts or because of they were having some other problem with their family or whatever, social so society, whatever, trying to fit into the society, so they were in distress. So, it's a very common reason for people to come to Krishna consciousness, because they're in distress. I remember one time there was a young lady came to the Krishna Consciousness Movement. The reason why she came was her parents were arranging marriage for her. And she didn't want to marry the man. You know the situation, <laughs> right? So, you know, she came to the temple in distress, you know, wanted to become a devotee. <laughs> but her parents come, they took her away anyway. And, she got married and whatever. But it's a common thing, distress. So Klesh Agni. And then Shubhada. Pure devotional service, the beginning of all auspiciousness. We like to do things which are auspicious, right? The, some people even have websites, good times, bad times, <laughs> right? Because there's a time in the day called uh, Kala, what's it called, Kala, Kala Chita, something like that. There's a Kala Rahu, inauspicious time, Rahu Kala, Rahu Kala, in the day, every day there's Rahu Kala. When Rahu period begins in the day, inauspicious time. Not a good day to do it. Just like they have that day when people go and buy gold. What's that day called? Akshaya Tritya, right. Akshaya Tritya, right. People want to... It's a very good day, right? Auspicious day. People pick that day to go and begin their business, and buy gold, invest, and do things like that. So... Devotional service is the beginning of auspiciousness. We say Subhashya Sigram. The auspicious thing should be done immediately. Are you in this class? Yes, sorry, I couldn't come because I was sick in the last couple of days. What were you what were you sick with? Okay. So we begin at 10.30. Yes. Yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. 
So Shubhada, the beginning of all auspiciousness. We do like to take advantage of auspicious things. Even Srila Prabhupada was conscious about things. He had, uh, there's just some thing in Vedic culture that it's not auspicious to begin a journey on Thursday afternoon. So if Prabhupada, if somehow if Prabhupada was leaving on a Thursday afternoon, he would have his bag packed on Thursday morning and put outside the door because he considered it to be you know, not very auspicious to leave in the Thursday afternoon. So he made all arrangements to leave in the morning, although he's still there, but he didn't actually leave until the afternoon. So does this also mean that if you are performing the Mokha service, you don't have to worry about all these uh, astrology charts, or you don't have to worry about this auspicious or auspicious theories and problems? Yes, that's right. That's right. If we're actually taking full shelter of Krishna, then we don't have to worry about all of these astrological things. If we're going on behalf of Krishna, then that is auspicious. That is the most auspicious thing. You don't have to consider these material circumstances. But you have to be very transcendental. You have to be really up there on the transcendental platform. And if you're not, then you might you want to be careful. You know, just like when people when it comes to things like marriage, people will be very conscious to pick an auspicious day. There's a particular auspicious time for marriages, right? Just like Purushottam Mas. Nobody gets married in Purushottam Mas, right? You know that? There's never, nobody would have a marriage because it's not considered, it's not an auspicious time. So there are considerations. Now if you're really transcendental, then for Krishna, you don't have to worry. But some things, you know, were not so transcendental. And so, it's nice to also take advantage of auspicious times and, and be aware of what times are not auspicious. Just like in designing temples and buildings and so on, they have uh, the science of Vastu, Vastu Shastra, designing the building. The, you know, the doorway should face a particular way, the altar should be in a particular place, the temple altar should be some place, the kitchen, kitchen. It's all prescribed in the Vastu Shastra, the location of everything. So if you follow these things, it's an advantage. You don't follow, you can get problems. I was in one te I remember I was visiting one temple in Malaysia, and we had the, the, the temple there, they had two gates. Now, one gate they kept open, and the other gate they kept locked. But somehow the gate which was open, there were always accidents, practically, almost regularly, right at the, at the gate there, at the entrance to the temple. And it happened that somebody who knew about this Vastu science, they came there, and as soon as they saw it, they said, Oh, you should close this gate immediately and use the other gate. And as soon as they did that, there were no more accidents. It made a big difference. So, you know, these kind of things, practical things, that sometimes they help. You have to consider them. But devotional service, it's all auspicious for everyone. We can, just like you know, we're going, we're going to go on Harinam Sankirtan. It doesn't matter Thursday afternoon or what. We don't think, oh, this is not an auspicious time. No, we're going to do Harinam Sankirtan. That's the most auspicious thing. So it doesn't matter what day of the week or what time is auspicious. Like that. 
And then, of course, there are also eclipses. Eclipses are generally considered inauspicious times. Does it mean we don't, we don't go out and preach? Does it mean we just sit around in the temple and... No. We, we can still go out for Krishna's service. That can go on regardless. If you read the story about the deity which was uh, installed in London, in England, they have one deity there which was installed. So the deity actually, at the time they were building the temple, they were getting ready to open the temple, they had no deities. They had no deities and Prabhupada really wanted to get deities for the temple. He thought it would be so nice if we can have some deities for the temple. But where to get deities? And they, they hadn't thought of, they didn't, you know, they had no contact with India. This was 1969 and there, were no, there was nobody to send deities from India to, you know, it was just, we hadn't started anything like that yet. So how to get deities? Then they heard that there was some man, some Indian society in London, who had deities. And uh, for some reason, they didn't want to install them. Because the deity, one of the little fingers on Radharani's hand had become cracked. And because there was a crack in her little finger, they didn't want to install the deity. So Prabhupada went there with the devotees, and Prabhupada saw the deities, and as soon as he saw the deities, he fell in love with them. And so he talked to the man nicely and everything. And then Prabhupada said, so, we will take them. <laughs> and the man was saying, no, no, wait a minute, no. No, Prabhupada said, no, it's okay, we'll take them. <laughs> Prabhupada told the devotees, pick them up, can't put them in the car. <laughs> and they practically kidnapped the deities, you know. <laughs> and took the deities off. And, and Prabhupada said, he said later, he said, actually, he said, Radharani did like that, just to trick these people. That the crack in her finger was arranged by Krishna or by Srimati Radharani, just so these deities could be installed in the temple. So they were thinking because the deity's fingers crack, oh, it's no good, it's not as, no, we can't do it, it's not auspicious, we have to get new deities here. But Prabhupada didn't care about a little crack in the finger, not a Understand? So for Krishna devotional service, that is the most auspicious. Okay, moksha, laguta, krit. Those in pure devotional service derive even the conception of liberation. And devotees are not anxious for liberation. Liberation, moksha. For the impersonalists, for the monists, impersonalism, that liberation is the goal. But for a devotee it's not important. We don't care about liberation. The devotees are already liberated. You're already liberated. Hmm? When you're chanting Hare Krishna, worshipping Krishna, you're already liberated. Devotional service begins on the platform of liberation. Right? Remember 18th chapter Bhagavad Gita? Yeah. See the verse? See? Yeah. Brahma Bhutta Prasannatma. Prasannatma. One who is Brahma Bhut, one who knows he's not the body, who knows he's Brahman, then he's a joyful soul. Right? So that is the beginning of devotional service. But for the monists, for the Mayavadi, the Vedantas, their goal is liberation. But we don't care about liberation, not important for the world. And then, Sadurlabha, pure devotional service rarely achieved. 
Bhagavad Gita says, Manushyanam Sahasreshu. Translation? Out of thousands among men, hardly one is endeavoring for perfection. And of those who have achieved perfection, hardly one knows me in truth. So devotional service, Sudurlapa, very rarely achieved. We don't just get it by our own efforts. That's the point. We'll talk more about it. Then Sandrananda Vishesh Atma automatically puts one in transcendental pleasure. Right? Our pleasure is not like the pleasure of the materialistic people. Materialistic people, their pleasure is, you know, a very different level from the pleasure of a devotee. Our pleasure is transcendental. You know, the pleasure we get chanting Hare Krishna, taking Krishna Prasadam, seeing the deities, going to holy places, very special pleasure. Other people, their pleasure is like pleasure of the crow. You know the crows in Calcutta? Where are the crows? Where do you see the crows in Calcutta? In the garbage, right? Place of pilgrimage for the crows. Srimad Bhagavatam says, the place of pilgrimage for the crows. So the crow-like people, their place of pilgrimage is? Huh? In the garbage. <laughs> Yeah, they go to the garbage cinemas, the garbage restaurants, the garbage casinos, the garbage bars. <laughs> they, they, these places are just like garbage pits, right? So that's the pleasure of the crows. But devotees' pleasure is a very different level. So, Sandra Nanda Visheshatma, then? Sri Krishna Karshini. The only means to attract Krishna. Okay? So six characteristics of pure devotional service. Now, you have to understand. Remember, we sp I explained yesterday that there Three different kinds of devotional service. First one is sadhana bhakti, and then after sadhana bhakti, bhava bhakti, and after bhava bhakti comes. All right. So sadhana bhakti, they will. In, somebody's doing sadhana bhakti. They will enjoy the first two characteristics of devotional service. Klesh Agni and Shubhada. That is for people doing sadhana bhakti. How is your sadhana today? All your rounds chanted? Did you go to morning program? Hmm? Yeah, you went to morning program? Good. So sadhana bhakti, klesh agni and shubhada. Somebody comes and takes up sadhana bhakti, starts doing devotional service, they will feel immediately relief from distress. We got one boy, I remember, I, 
one boy came walking past the temple and he was so miserable and he, was, and he said, I had an argument with my girlfriend and she kicked me out. She doesn't want me anymore. She gave me up. So we, you know, we talked to him, oh, don't worry about it Prabhu, come on, come with us, come and, come and chant Hare Krishna and you can have breakfast with us, we're going to have some prasadam. So he came to the temple and he's chanting and he became, you know, like for a couple of days he was with us. And then after a few days then he didn't come anymore. What happened? He found another girlfriend. To do. Okay. Go get the huh? Go get the okay, so these two Klesh Agni, relief from distress, and Shubhada, the beginning of all auspiciousness. For the sadhana bhakta. Can we become a pure devotee if we're just doing sadhana bhakti? Is that pure devotion? If we're doing sadhana bhakti, is that pure devotion? Huh? Yes, it is pure devotion. There are pure devotees on all different levels. Some devotees are on the level of sadhana bhakti, some are on the level of bhava bhakti, and some are prema bhaktis. So pure devotees can be on all different levels. Not that everybody who's a pure devotee has to be on the highest level of the love of God. Prabhupada was asked, are there any other pure devotees on the planet beside you? And Prabhupada said, how many members do we have in our society? The devotees said, well, about 2,000. So Prabhupada said, then there are at least that many pure devotees. Prabhupada said all the devotees who are following, pure devotees, right? If you're not doing sinful activities, you're chanting Hare Krishna, then that's pure devotion. So sadhana bhakti, you enjoy these two levels, these two characteristics, and then bhava bhakti, you get two more. We bring in two more as well as Klesh Agni and Shubhada, Moksha Laguta Krit and Sudurlaba. Sudurlaba, rarely achieved. So, two more characteristics. And then for Prima Bhakti, we get two more characteristics. So there are all six characteristics for someone who, who's on the level of Prima Bhakti. They also experience this Samdrananda Vishesh Atma and Sri Krishna Karshini. The only means to attract Krishna and Transcendental pleasure, prema bhakti. Someone who's got prema bhakti, he's like a madman. He's laughing sometimes. He's just laughing and laugh. People want. What's he laughing at? People don't can't understand because he's on the level of prema bhakti. He's thinking of Krishna. And Maybe he's even seeing Krishna's pastimes in his mind. So he's laughing, enjoying relations with Krishna. So people cannot understand. Okay? No difficulties with these things? Sadhana, Baba and Krim. Two characteristics for sadhana bhakti, two, two more characteristics for bhava, and then two more for prima bhakti. So we're going to look at this thing a bit. Material suffering. 
Why do we suffer? What's the cause of our suffering? Sinful activities, yes. Why do people perform sinful activities? Yes. But there's something between sinful, it's not just the ignorance, there's the desire, right? Ignorance, and then from ignorance comes material desires. And from material desires, people do sinful activities. And sinful activities create the suffering. That's the problem. So suffering has this, there's a cycle like that, you see. Sinful activities, uh, we do something sinful, when you do something sinful, then you get more desires, you see, when you perform some sinful activity, then you get, it comes back to you, get more desires. It's not like you do something sinful and then you forget it. You do something sinful, then you want to do something more sinful. Just like the thief. Someone may, may he may be a, a, uh, he has a desire to steal, right? Because of ignorance, he wants, he has material desires, he wants to get wealth, and he thinks about stealing it. So he goes, he does some, steal something. So when he steals, it's not like he stops and, okay, I stole it, now I've got, he wants, he thinks, I'm going to steal more. I got I stole, I got it, nobody caught me. I'm going to steal more, I'm going to steal again. Right? The, the desire to do more sinful activity comes. So the sinful activities cause more material desire. And then more material desire, you do more sinful activity. You don't give them up. Prabhupada gives the example about the the man, people have a desire for, the, the man who has sex desire, and he, because of sex desire, he engages in sinful activities, and then he gets some disease, suffering. He engaged in, in a lot of illicit sexual activity, so he got some sinful, he got some some horrible sexual disease, what is it, like venereal disease or something. That's one of the sexual diseases you get. And then the treatment is very painful. And of course it's very humiliating, very shameful that you have to get treated for this kind of thing. But even after suffering and going through all the treatment and everything, the man still has desire. So he doesn't give up the desire. The, the suffering didn't stop, and again, he will continue to engage in sinful activities. That is the problem with sinful life. The 
there's no end to it. In the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna asked the question to Krishna about why is one compelled to sinful activities, even unwilling, as if engaged by force? And what does Lord Krishna say? Yeah. It is lust only, O Arjuna, the all-devouring sinful enemy. And what is the nature of that lust? Yes. Give me the English. Never say tears like fire. Never satisfied. Burns like fire. When you put fuel on the fire, then the fire increases. It doesn't go out. So satisfying material desires doesn't put the, the desire for activities out of your mind. It simply increases the desire for more sinful activities. So this is the problem. Uh, people don't know how to stop the stress. So how to get relief from the stress? They're in the stress, they're suffering. And what do some people do to try to get relief from the stress? Prayaschit. Huh? Prayaschit. Prayaschit. Okay. Prayaschit or atonement. Uh, what, give an example of an, an atonement. What would you do as a prayaschit? Huh? Some sacrifice. What? What kind of sacrifice? Where? <coughs> what do you talk? You have to be more clear. You say sacrifice. There's many kinds of sacrifices. What kind of sacrifice are you talking about? If you confess. Huh? If you confess and uh, be remorseful and ask for uh, redemption. Well, yeah, that would be in the, in the Catholic Church. Maybe you could do like that. You go to confession and confess your sins. And what would the priest say? Uh, would he? He may give you some. He may give you some. He may tell you to chant on your rosary more beads or something. Yeah. Well, I meant to confess to Krishna. And just to oh. Krishna. Would that be okay? Well, yeah, you have, but you have to be very genuine in your heart that you're confessing to Krishna. You know, you, you can't go every day and confess, right? Well, today I did this Krishna. And tomorrow, oh, oh, well, Krishna, I'm sorry I did it again, you know. <laughs> you can confess. Prabhupada said, you can fall down once or twice and Krishna will forgive you. But if you fall down all the time, Krishna is not going to forgive you. It's not going to take you very seriously. If you fall down all the while, you know, once or twice you can, okay. But if it's all the time, then it's not good. So there's, there's some standards there. So prayaschit, atonement, things like, yes? Charity. Yes, people may give charity. That's all. People coming here to Mayapur, holy places like that, they come to, often people come with that purpose in mind to do some atonement, to do some prayaschit, to give charity. Why are they giving charity? Not just because they're good people. Well, they're a little good, but they have their motive. They want to get relief from their sins, right? They want to make up for their sinful activities. That's their thinking. There is sometimes people go to take bath in Yes, some people think like that. So, the water of the Ganges purifies, but purifies very gradually, after a long time. So, it does purify, but a lot after a long time. Does one have to also be very genuine when they charity or they take a bath? Do 
Well, what do you mean genuine? Genuine about what? Oh, they genuinely feel sorry? Yeah. Does that genuineness have to be there when you do charity or they take it back? Or can it just be done out of Well, that, it, it can also be done out just out of faith, but there will be more benefit if one is genuine. Right? If one is genuine about it and genuinely repentant and feels guilty that I did wrong and I shouldn't do this again, then that's very good. That's certainly better than the person who just does it and then goes back and continues to sin. We definitely don't want to make a habit of sinful activities. Okay, material suffering, klesha and me, meaning destroys. So bhakti yoga, devotional service will destroy material suffering. We get immediate relief from all kinds of distress by doing bhakti yoga, by doing devotional service. And we're talking about the level of sadhana bhakti. Some examples. How we get relief? Simply by chanting the holy name of Krishna once, a person is relieved from all the reactions of a sinful life. Is it possible? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it possible? She is doubtful. Some of you are not so, you think, say yes? So we can go and kill a few Brahmins? <laughs> Pure chanting, that's the point quality in the chanting of the holy name. To get the benefit, one chanting, if you chant purely, then you get that kind of benefit. But it's not so easy to chant the pure name. We are trying to chant, right? We want to come to that level. Pure chanting, there is very high level. It's possible, but we have to understand if we chant purely, then you get that. And then the other thing, when the person circumambulates Tosi Devi, all the sins we may have committed are destroyed, even the killing of a Brahmana. So it's possible, but Again, not for everybody, not every time, but sometimes will be. All right, let me read in the Nectar of Devotion, quoting further on, page 91, jumping over. It says, a devotee should not expect immediate relief from the reactions of his past misdeeds. We should not expect to get relief from our past misdeeds. But we were quoting here once chanting and going around to see. So, what is it? Another one. A devotee who is not perfectly free from the resultant actions should therefore continue to act in Krishna consciousness seriously, even though there may be so many impediments. So devotee, but he's not completely free. There, there may be so many impediments. 
but it still has to end in Krishna consciousness. And then there are statements like this from Bhagavad Gita, which you know from 18th chapter, Sarva Dharma Paragyajna, like this, abandon all. Abandon, abandon all varieties of religion, just surrender unto me. I will free you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. Right? So, we want to understand what is it? Are we going to get immediate relief from our sinful reactions? You think just because we come to the temple and we put a nice sari on and put a nice tilak on, does it mean no more sinful reactions, all the distress is gone? No, right? There's still going to be some reactions, it will take some time. We give the example just like the fan. It doesn't stop immediately, still got some momentum. So the sinful reactions are still there, but not gradually they'll stop, gradually. We have to keep going, we have to keep doing our bhakti, we have to keep chanting and hearing and gradually we'll get rid of all of the sins. It will just take some time. We just have to be patient and keep practicing devotional service. We cannot expect that immediately we'll get free of everything, immediately we'll come to transcendental level. Last week we were in total maya and this week, <laughs> this week I'm chanting Hare Krishna and I come, you know, I'm ready to go back to Godhead. No. It's not going to be like that, is it? It, took t it takes time. It's going to take time. We have to, we're talking about practice. Devotional service in practice. Okay, simple activities, do not fear. Srila Prabhupada has extended Krishna's statement in the Bhagavad Gita to the spiritual master who is Krishna's representative, that if you surrender to the spiritual master at the time of initiation, you become free from all sinful reactions. So those of you who are initiated, that's the understanding. Some people think like that, that now I'm initiated, I'm free from all sinful reactions. Now I'm, I can go back to Godhead. Some people even think like that. I'm initiated now, I can already go back to Godhead, I got initiation. No, initiation is the beginning. It's the beginning, it's not the end. Some people, some foolish people think it's the end. It's just the beginning. But they also do say the time of initiation, the spiritual master will take all the karma. You take the karma from the disciple. If the disciple fully surrenders to the guru, then the guru can take them. But most people, when they get initiated, do not fully surrender. You know, they're taking initiation, they're thinking, you know, I think I want to be a devotee. <laughs> I think about it, I think so. They haven't fully surrendered. That will take time, gradually, so. so gradually the spiritual master takes the karma. Are we actually free from all sinful reactions immediately when we surrender? Or do we gradually become free? We gradually become free. Read? Somebody read? Read.
Krishna will take charge of the devotee's sinful reactions. And use the devotee's sinful reactions for the benefit of the devotee, to help the devotee to surrender more. Yes, Prabhu? Huh? It seems like karma has to go somewhere, like it has to be used somehow, it cannot just disappear karma. It has to be used some sort of karma. Is that correct? Karma is not eternal. Karma can be removed. It's not eternal, right? So it can be, the karma can be changed. It's like when we surrender to Krishna, the karma is all changed. Some, uh, one astrologer in Delhi, quite a well-known astrologer, devotee went to see him and the devotee, he told the devotee, he said, no, he said, I can't tell you anything about your future. He said, because you're a devotee. He said, you're doing devotional service. He said, so all the lines on your hand, they don't have any meaning anymore. Because you're chanting Hare Krishna, you're worshipping the deities. So these lines, they don't mean anything anymore because you're a devotee. So that's the power of devotional service. Maybe in the stars, but devotional service is more powerful. Karma is not supremely powerful. Krishna is. Krishna can change the karma. And so the karma can all be removed. We will hear. This is what we're talking about. Devotional service will remove all the distress. The distress is caused by karma and it can all be removed by bhakti. So the karma is not eternal. Yes? Yes, Prima? Yes. So the, the previous quote that we just saw, that, that was uh, like when our, yes, our personal karma is being transferred to what is sometimes within the words as Krishna karma. Sometimes I, I see it in that way. But it's not really your karma anymore, but it's just like because you have so many... Krishna karma means working for Krishna. When it says Krishna karma, as it says in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the Vishwarupa, almost the second last verse of the 11th chapter, Krishna talks about, or it talks about Krishna karma. Prabhupada in the purport talks about Krishna karma. And Krishna karma means working for Krishna, doing work for the pleasure of Krishna. Karma means work. The spiritual master has to be transparent. He has to offer everything to Krishna. Although Prabhupada did say, you know, before Prabhupada left the world, he was in very poor health and he held up his arm and it was just bone, just skin and bone, there was no flesh there. He said, this is the result of accepting too many unqualified disciples. So Prabhupada warned that we should be very cautious about accepting devotees as disciples. They should be properly qualified. That is why before initiation we have things like a waiting period. 
after you approach someone for initiation, then you have to wait. You don't get initiation right away. You have to wait. There's a testing period of at least six months and maybe usually a year before the person is initiated. That is to allow the person who's coming for initiation that they can remove all of their karma, get rid of all their bad karma through devotional service. Because if they're chanting every day and they're following the regulated principles, then they'll get rid of all their karma. And then when they come for initiation, they won't have a lot of heavy karma to give the guru. So before they accept disciples, they have to be purified. They have to undergo some purification, the probationary period before the initiation, when they're strictly following the regulated principles and chanting. Then they get initiation. And after initiation they do something simple. Does the spiritual master get the reaction or does Krishna get the reaction? Well, it will depend a lot on, you see, the relationship between the spiritual master and the disciple. Just like we see that there's Diksha Guru and Shiksha Guru also. So who has been guiding that person? Has he been taking instruction from the Diksha Guru? He took initiation. Has he been taking instruction? Who's, the, who's responsible for him? If he, has, if he has not really approached the Guru, and just took the initiation, went off independently, acted on, on his own, then the spiritual master is not obliged to take the reactions. Because he, he had no serious connection with the spiritual master. But if he is a genuine devotee, if he's actually a devotee, a serious devotee, practicing devotion, then if he does something sinful, it's not considered very serious. As described in the Bhagavad Gita, Apichet Sudaracharo Bhajate Mamananyaba, that he quickly becomes righteous and attains lasting peace. So, it's, you see, you have to consider the particular case. What kind of person is it who did something sinful? What were the circumstances? Was he a serious devotee who had an accidental fall down? Or was it somebody who took initiation very cheaply and then after taking initiation he didn't he wasn't really serious about initiation and he didn't really try to keep the vows and he just went and did nonsense. So he cheated. At the time of initiation he came before the spiritual master and he took the vows, but he cheated. He thought he was cheating Krishna. He thought he was cheating the Guru, but he was cheating himself. Mama. Yeah? Sometimes he did. Sometimes he would come and say, not too many people, I don't want to initiate all these people. So you have to make it less people. Sometimes he did. I've never heard this internal and external initiation. Where did you get this from? Huh? Madhavananda. And so you Well, I don't know. 
but generally the process is, you know, you take instruction, you have association, you take instruction, and you take instruction from several people, and then one of these people will become prominent, and you make him the diksha, and you ask for the initiation, and you take initiation from that one. But after initiation, you still take instruction from other people. You see, ISKCON is a very special society. Although we have many spiritual masters, it's not like you have a connection only with the spiritual master. We take initiation into ISKCON. You don't take initiation just to be the disciple of that guru, but you take initiation to become a member of ISKCON. And it's never been like that, usually. In the past, you know, people got initiation. You, you, there was no institution. You see, this is special. Because in the past, there were no institutions, except for Gaudiya Mat. You know, Gaudiya Mat was there. And so Prabhupada built up from the Gaudiya Mat. He followed the Gaudiya Mat. So is it fair to say that when you get initiated into Islam, since Prabhupada said that this one is my body, that's when well, you can accept him as your Shiksha Guru before initiation. You don't have to be initiated to accept him as your Shiksha Guru. Anybody who comes to ISKCON, they can approach Srila Prabhupada sincerely and take shelter of him and take him as their Shiksha Guru. You don't have to be, wait until your initiation make that relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on. Maliji. Maliji. All right, it's quite a nice statement here. I just want to say a bit more. Yeah, there's a bit more. Go ahead. The Lord therefore creates a particular situation to eradicate this remaining Indian spirit. This unhappiness suffered by a sincere devotee is not particularly a kind of reaction. It is rather the Lord's special mercy for comparing this devotee, for inducing this devotee to completely let go of the material world. All right. So the suffering which we go undergo, which devotees undergo, it's not karma. Because they've come to Krishna and they've surrendered to Krishna. So when they suffer, it's not karmic reactions. It's the arrangement of Krishna to help us to let go of our attachment to the material world and to help us to fully take shelter of Krishna. Because we still, you know, we think, oh well, I'm a devotee, all right. I'll surrender one day, you know. Anyway, I'm chanting, you know, give me time. People always say, give me time, just give me time, you know. So Krishna sometimes puts us into difficulties gives us some troubles, takes things away from us. You lose things, you lose friends, you lose whatever you value, Krishna takes them away just to help us to become more attached to Him. So this is the idea. So suffering of a devotee is not like the suffering of another person materialist, non-devotee, they're also suffering. They're suffering karma, 
We're suffering, our suffering, Krishna's mercy to purify us. So tribulations resulting from vicious actions means karma. Not tribulations, the difficulties offered by Krishna to his devotees are different. How do we know what's the difference? You have to see who's a devotee and who is not. You have to see the result. judge, the devotee knows himself. So you should be able to assert the himself in the Yes, the devotee should know. The devotee knows, is this Krishna's mercy or is this my karma? At the same time, we all sometimes there's a verse in Bhagavatam which says, the devotee will accept the suffering as the reactions due to his past karma. But he will go on performing devotional service. He's not going to give up. He may suffer a lot, but he will not give up devotional service. Even though he's suffering, he's still going to continue. So Maharaj, what, what's the better attitude to the Think that is my karma or is Krishna mercy? Well, the body may think we can think it's karma. We think, certainly for us, we will think it's karma. But for others, we will think they're suffering Krishna's mercy. So Krishna is the cause of difficulties for his devotee in order to increase their devotion. Right? The difficulties are to increase their devotion. Remember Queen Kunti's prayers? Have you read Srimad Bhagavatam? Prayers by Queen Kunti? Read? No? Chapter 8, first canto. Queen Kunti says, I wish that all these difficulties would happen again and again so that I might see Krishna again and again. And seeing Krishna means I will never have to see birth and death. So Queen Kunti prays to Krishna, let the difficulties happen again and again. Are you praying to Krishna like that? Yes? Really? No, oh, you're any great. Just like rather Lord Chaitanya Shikshastikam prayers. Lord Chaitanya says, uh, I know no one but Krishna is my Lord and he will always remain so, even though he may handle me roughly and make me broken hearted by not being present before me. He's free to do anything and everything with me, but he's always my worshipful Lord unconditionally. So, this is the mood of Radharani. Radharani prays that if my unhappiness makes Krishna happy, this is my happiness. Right? Right? Do you know that you, if you're married, if you have a, a wife like that, would your wife say like that? The wife said, my dear husband, if my unhappiness makes you happy, that is my happiness. Right? Did you ever hear your mother say that to your father? No. <laughs> no. 
Because that love, that kind of pure love, that's only in the spiritual world. That's only in relation to Krishna. Right? So difficulties, the cause of our Krishna is arranging our difficulties to increase our devotion. You have to remember that. When Krishna takes everything away, makes me broken hearted. Oh Krishna. Thank you, Krishna. Okay, we'll take a break.
Okay, get them in. Where are they? Okay, we're still on Klesha Agni. Klesha meaning? Huh? Continue suffering. Klesha Agni meaning? Relief from material distress. Right? Get relief from material distress. We all want to get relief. When we're suffering, we're looking, help me to get free, help me to get rid of all this suffering. So, you can see, just like I drew on the board there, so here's the same thing here. On the bottom, avidya. Avidya, ignorance, the root cause. And above avidya, bijam. Bijam means like the seed, material desires. The material desires are there in the form of seeds in the heart. And then papam. Papam is sinful activity. And the result is suffering. So three kinds of suffering, three causes of suffering. The causes are sinful actions, material desires and ignorance. So Krishna Consciousness, we're trying to give people knowledge, to take away the ignorance, let people know, help them to understand what is proper action, how to behave, what to do, what not to do. Right? This is the idea of our Krishna Consciousness movement. Papam, sin. There are two stages of sinful reactions, two stages. One is called parabda and the other is called aparabda. Parabda means, well, aparabda is the immature or the unmanifested and the parabda is the manifest. What would be an example of something, somebody's sinful activities we say has got some parabda karma? Right? What's the example? It's got, huh? Yeah, somebody's poor. That's their parabda karma. If somebody's lame. Somebody's blind. Somebody's a cripple. It's their parabda karma. Right? So it's it's mature. It's manifest. And aparabda karma. What's the upper of the karma? We don't know. <laughs> it's not manifest. We don't know what the upper of the karma is. Because it's immature. We don't know what they're going to be like, what's going to happen. could say that it's aparabda, he's, you know, he's waiting. Of course, the fact that he's waiting because he, he's a criminal, he, know, he, he knows he did something sinful, so he's worried. Are the police coming? Are they coming to get me? So he's, that, that in itself is some of the, that's manifest, the, the suffering, the anxiety which he goes through 
wondering, when are the police going to come and get me? Are they going to come and question me? But will they take me like that? So that suffering, that's also there. It's already began to manifest. But the aparabdha, it, just like someone may have some sinful desires, it, it's not yet there in the heart. The desire is not there. It's, but it will come in the course of time. It, it just takes some time before it matures. Just like children, we could say children are immature. You don't know what they're going to be like once they grow up. Once they become mature, then they're different. Prabhupada explains, sinful activities are of two kinds, those that are mature and those which are not mature. The sinful activities for which we are suffering at the present moment are called mature. The many sinful activities stored within us for which we have not yet suffered are considered immature. So just like you gave the example, like the man did some crying, he knows he's going to get caught one day and he's going to suffer for it. So aparabdha. But we have also aparabdha karma from previous life. From previous lives we have karma and we you know some of it, some of it is good and some of it is not good. Some of it's going to cause us distress, going to bring us suffering. Not necessarily that it has to be from this life, it could have been from previous lives. And we have aparabdha karma, it can be from the family. Maybe some, there's some bad karma in the family or in the country, in the society, community, like that. We take karma. Yeah? Why you mention that you know, some people have like, uh, are more sensitive than others, and some people have more, like, higher pain tolerance. So when they get the simple reaction, they might not phase them so much. Yeah. Yeah. We could say it's to do with their karma. Some people are not so disturbed. Some people they get you know they suffer. They get a, it's no big deal for them. We may think oh they're suffering so much. Ah, oh, it's okay. No big deal. Some people don't. It would be better to be born like some more sensitive to the like, other nature surrounding. Hmm. It would be better to. It would be better to take the birth of a uh, more sensitive person to suffer because then you learn your lesson and it's faster. Well, <laughs> better to take birth as a devotee. Not just have to, not just to learn about suffering, but better to learn about Krishna consciousness. If someone's a devotee, then if someone's devotee, then naturally they will avoid sinful activity. They won't be attracted. They won't have the tendency to sin. That's much better. Yes, can be like that, yes, can be like that, it can be due to something happened in the past. Okay, let's see. So here's a scriptural verse to support how parabdha karma can be destroyed. Parabdha karma means reactions which are manifest. So in this verse, this is from third canto, Lord Kapila, Actually, Devahuti 
Lord Kapila's mother, she's speaking this verse to Lord Kapila. It's a famous verse. If you do Bhakti Vaibhav, after you finish Bhakti Shastri, you have to learn this verse. Yannama deha shravanadu kirtanad yat smaranad yat pranavad yat smaranad apikachit vajopi sadhya shravanaya kalpate kunat kudapanas tvam bhagavan nidarshanad that even a person born in a family of dog eaters so that's his parabdha karma the parabdha karma was he was born in a family of dog eaters but how was his parabdha karma all destroyed? No, no, he became eligible to do a Vedic cycle. But what he did, he once uttered the holy name of the Supreme Personality. Once uttered the holy name, or chant about him, hears about his pastimes, offers obeisances, or even remembers him by doing any one of these things. Even once, even if he's born in a family of dog eaters, he becomes eligible to perform a Vedic sacrifice. Now usually to perform a Vedic sacrifice, you have to be born in a very high class family. You have to be a Brahmana. You should be a Brahmana. You should be in a Brahma, born in a good Brahmana family to do a Vedic Yagya. But anybody who chants the holy name, one time, even though they're born in the dog-eating family, they become qualified to do this yadya. So this is the example how parabdha karma can be changed. Right? Once we start to chant the holy name, once you start to worship Krishna, you're no longer considered born in a low-class family. Now you're reborn. Right? And the next one is destroying aparabdha karma. Aparabdha reactions means not yet manifest. Subtle things which are there in the heart. The things which haven't appeared yet. You know, in the heart. They're there in the heart but they haven't come out yet. So they can also be removed. And this verse from the 11th canto, Srimad Bhagavatam describes that Krishna is telling Uddhava, devotional service to me is just like a blazing fire which can burn into ashes, unlimited fuel supplied to it. So you may have a lot of wood, you may have a lot of coal, you may have a lot of oil, you can burn it all, a big ocean of fuel can be burned to ashes by one spark of devotion. Even a woman can perform a very sacrifice? Well, usually not. We don't usually see women do Vedic yakyas. No. I've never seen it. But, of course, women can achieve the supreme destination. It's just, you know, Vedic yakya is something, you know, it's the man's duty, it's not a woman, a woman's duty. Women do other things, you know. There's certain things women do, men cannot do. You know? You, know? you know, women give birth to children, men cannot do that. So devotional service is like a blazing fire, it burns the, all the aparabdha karma to ashes, takes away all these desires from the heart. Papam, talking about 
sin. Persons who are completely engaged in the devotional service of Lord Vishnu, the Personality of Godhead, become completely extinct from all sorts of vicious reactions either potential, germinating, seedling, or current by a gradual process. So, you want to understand this? That there are different stages of sinful reactions. Different stages. Just like one stage of sinful reaction may come desires. Why do people have sinful desires? Why do some people desire to do sinful things and others don't do it? Yeah, but you could say other people were in ignorance too, but some people, they actually go on to desire to do sinful things, but... Huh? Yeah, there, there's, it's due to some karma from the past, right? That we've done some sinful activities in the past and therefore we have a tendency towards sin again, which comes. Whereas other people, they didn't have that tendency, they didn't have that karma. So they don't have that inclination towards sinful activities. So there's different stages of sin. So, the point is here that by devotion to the Supreme Lord Vishnu, the Personality of Godhead, we get rid of all the different phases of desires. Now, we were talking about atonement. If you do atonement, now that may counteract sinful activities, but it doesn't take away the desire for sin. Right? You do, you did, just like Prabhu said, you do some charity for your atonement. You're going to give charity. Right? How much are you going to give? Ten rupees. <laughs> A bit more, right? Yeah. You're going to give some rupees. You're going to do some charity. Does that mean he's not going to desire sinful activities anymore? No. There will still be desire for sinful activities. This is the problem with prayaschit. You do that kind of atonement. That is compared to the bathing of the elephant. The elephant, you know, have you, have you watched the elephants when they get clean? They bathe them. If you go one day and watch the elephants down the road there, you see the elephant yard? They've got a bath there and they, they hose the elephants. They get them clean. And then after they bathe, they come out and the elephants will throw dirt on themselves. They themselves, they pick up the dirt with their trunk and throw it over themselves. You know, they do it. That's how the elephant does. It's just their nature. So, people do like that. They do pious activity, they do sinful activity. Then they do more pious activity, then they do more sinful activity. They're doing the pious activity to counteract their sins, but they don't stop sinful activity. So how to stop sinful activity? Yeah, you have to take away the desire, right? Remember? The desire. So long as you have sinful acts, something like some people do at home. But still, desires are there. You have to get rid of the material desires. Right? How are we going to get rid of the material desires? Some people think, by Gyan, we'll give knowledge. Teach people that these are wrong, that this is bad, we have to stop doing this, we have to educate people, give them knowledge. But that will help for some time. But it still doesn't take away the desire. Only one thing can take away the desire. What's going to take away the desire? Yeah. 
Bhakti yoga, devotional service. Only devotional service takes away the desire. That's the test. How much have you become Krishna conscious that you have to give up sinful activity? So only bhakti yoga takes away the desire for sin. Other processes, jnana yoga, karma kanda, jnana kanda, that can take away the reaction of sins. But it doesn't take away the desire for sin. The desire for sin is still there. And you, we have to get rid of the desire for sin. And then no more sin for them. Why what? Can you explain why only bhakti yoga and not another Why only bhakti yoga takes away the desire? That is the unique power of bhakti yoga because Krishna is the supreme purifying agent. And so Krishna takes away that desire of sin from the heart of the devotee. When we take shelter of Lord Krishna, Krishna is like the sun, right? We say when the sun comes up, just like here in Mayapur. Have you been here in Mayapur in the winter? Yeah? You see the fog in the morning, in the winter? Shofan, what time do you wake up in the morning? You see the fog in the morning? Yeah. So, when the fog comes up in the... what takes away the fog? Yeah, right. As soon as the sun comes, a little ray of sun, then the fog goes. Never comes back. So the, the fog is like... what's it like? Sins. The fog is like the sinful desires and the sinful reactions. And as soon as the sun comes up, then the, all the, as soon as Krishna, as soon as we begin devotional service, all of the sinful reactions they all go away, sinful desires, they're all removed. So that is why only bhakti yoga does that, because of Krishna. Krishna is like the sun. Okay, there's a big text here. Who wants to read? Prabhu. So describing the different stages of sin. Papam means sin, right? So we get rid of all these different stages. It's describing the stages. First of all, this uh, kutam. Kutam is the stage before bijam. Kutam. Kutam means, you know, oh, I'm interested how you steal. How do people do that? How do they rob the bank? How do they get the money? How do they rob the bank? Well, that's interesting. No, you know, you have a, you, a kutam, you have a bit of interest in it. And then bijam is the actual desire to do it. Ah, you know, how are we going to do it? You know, I want to think about how to do it. The desire becomes a bit... Kutam is just the initial thought about it. You know, you're, you're not actually planning to do it, but you think about it. But then bijam is the seed where you're actually thinking about doing the sinful thing, right? So kutam, bijam, and then aparabdha. You get the, the reaction and parabdha. Why is that? Wait. Prabhu. 
พลิกขึ้นไปโอเค so so it seems it's not a gradual process they're saying it's actually stopped the power is stopped as soon as they take up devotional service it's stopped but still some momentum there so here's the diagram on the top here papam sinful action and then two stages one is unmanifest Well, un it's both aparabdha. Both is aparabdha. Unmanifested reaction, and one leads to parabdha. Well, it's aparabdha first of all, and then it becomes parabdha, becomes manifest. And on the other hand, we've got aparabdha, and it becomes kutam. It be you have a m more interest, more desire, just like I was explaining over here. Uh, when you do something sinful. You did something sinful. You think about doing it again. You still, you you have more. Really, well, I did it one time. I Parabda, direct physical suffering or emotional suffering, but the kutam is an interest. You have a, a desire to think. You're thinking more about doing these things, sinful acts, and that is also suffering. It's also, it's also indirect suffering. It's not manifest yet. So first of all, sin, papam, sinful activity causes aparabdha. You get reaction, not manifest. And see, so one on one hand it comes manifest from aparabdha becomes parabdha becomes manifest. This sinful reaction takes place; it appears. And on the other hand, it comes to kutam, sinful. Propensity or proclivity of the interest in sinful activities, the tendency towards sinful activities again. You do sin something sinful one time, you want to do it again. They try it again and again. Be dumb, sinful desire. So putam and be dumb. Sinful desire. The bijam is a seed. This is a seed. So here, it, it's not yet a seed. It's just a thought, an interest in it. The so kutam is first, and then bijam, the seed. Here is an actual seed, and that seed causes us to do sinful activities. It takes us again to papa up on the top. Here the same thing. The diagram. You can see it's a circle. It goes on. It's endless. It's very hard to get out of the the cycle. Sinful desire causes us to do sinful action. Sinful action gives us reaction. Maybe unmanifest that becomes manifest. Manifest you get suffering. But The unmanifest reaction, the aparabdha, sinful action, causes us to have more interest in sinful activities. We want to do more sins, and again more sinful desire. So endless cycle. Is it a sin to uh, see, like, uh, do something without Krishna, like, to rejoice, like traveling to another country? 
because I want to enjoy it, but nothing has to do with Krishna, is that a sin as well? Not necessarily like doing something bad. Well, sinful activity means you do something against the religious principles. Intoxication, gambling, meat eating, illicit sex, these are sinful. Eh? So you have to consider. You may be traveling, but what are you doing? You have to look at the, the act activities. What do you eat? What do you drink? You take drugs? You, what, do you, what kind of activities do you do? So you do these things, you get sinful reaction. Yeah, you get karma. Of course, you're going to get karma. But you're going to get heavy karma when you do the sinful activities. But everything you do, you get karma. Except if you do it for, for Krishna. Working for Krishna, you don't get any karma. Hmm? Material desires. Although one may neutralize the reaction of sinful life through austerity, charity, vows, and other methods, these pious activities cannot uproot the material desires in one's heart. Right? We, we may do charity, you do some vows, austerity. It's not going to take away the desires from the heart. It may counteract our sinful activities, but still will perform more sinful activities. However, if one serves the lotus feet of the Personality of Godhead, he's immediately free from all such contamination. Right? We gave the example, the sun comes up. As soon as the sun comes up, all the fog goes away. Yes? Question? No? All right, question for you. What two examples does Prabhupada use to describe the failure of other processes to free one from material desire? I covered them today, actually. I already spoke about them. Do you remember? The elephant, the, the elephant and what? And the dust. Yeah, the elephant throws the dust all over his body after it bathes. This is not actually devotee. This is for people on the path of karma. Karmis do that. The karmis are like the elephants. They'll do these things. Devotees don't do like that. But karmis do that. Yeah, and what's the other example? Yes, right, the sexually the sexual disease. The person still has the desire for sinful activity. Didn't lose his sex desire, although he suffered so much. So these two, the Prabhupada gives these two examples to show you don't get free of material desire. This sinful desire seed can be removed only by achieving Krishna consciousness. And this can be accomplished very easily by chanting Maha Mantra. As recommended by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That's why we encourage everyone to chant 16 rounds every day. Right? If you're chanting si 16 rounds every day, then it will help us to control the mind and to stay away from sinful activities. If you're not chanting 16 rounds, then we don't know. We don't know. You may be still engaged in sinful activities. Who, who didn't read yet? Desires for material enjoyment stop. 
Desires for fruitful activities are strongly rooted, but the trees of desire can be uprooted completely by devotional service, because devotional service implies superior desire. Hmm. So this is all from Srimad Bhagavatam. Devotional service is the higher taste, the superior desire, right? The param dristva nivartate, the higher taste. And so it uproots all these other desires, desires for fruit of activities. It said they are strongly rooted, but devotional service will uproot them. It's the power of bhakti yoga. These material desires become insignificant in the presence of Krishna consciousness. But you have to have strong desire for Krishna's service. Otherwise you won't be able to uproot material desire. In relation to avidya, Prabhu, So the false ego, like a rope, but can be cut by devotional service. Avidya, ignorance. Ignorance is due to the attack of the ignorance. False ego, this ignorance, I am this body, we become so attached to material things. But the devotees can easily cut off the knot of this strong rope. So this is the superior position of bhakti. Other processes, they have to try very hard to get rid of the false ego. But by devotional service, very easily we can change. You know, we get people becoming devotees. Before they became devotees, they were very proud and angry and arrogant, so many bad qualities. And then they become devotees, they become humble and gentle. They change. Yes? Who, d who didn't read yet? Problem? Can you read? So, this is ignorance, the identity. We have to educate people. We're not the body, we're all spirit souls. We're acting under the modes of nature. No more. So the snakes are compared to ignorance. When there's a fire, the snakes, they have no legs. They cannot jump. They cannot jump over the fire. They cannot jump through the flame. They get burned in the fire. So the snakes of ignorance are burned by the fire 
of Krishna consciousness by the fire of bhakti yoga. It's a nice example. So, to review Klesh Agni, Papam, sinful reactions. And then Parabda, Parabda Karma, the, the verses from Third Canto, Lord Kapila, Devahuti, speaking to Lord Kapila, and she's saying, even you're born in what kind of family? A dog eaters. If they one time, what do they do? Chant the holy name or? Here. Hear, hear the glories of the Lord or remember Him or offer obeisances, yes. Then what can they do? Then they become qualified to? To perform a Vedic sacrifice. Even though they're born in the family of the dog eaters, they become qualified to perform a Vedic sacrifice. So this is an example of how devotional service destroys parabda karma. And then aparabda karma, the verses from the eleventh canto, and it's Krishna speaking to Uddhava. He said, devotional service unto me is like, like a blazing fire. Blazing fire can burn how much wood? Unlimited amounts of fuel can be burned to ashes. So devotional service to Krishna can destroy unlimited amounts of sinful desires. The aparabdha, not manifest yet. It's in the heart, but it hasn't grown yet. Just like in the ground. In the ground there's a lot of seeds in the ground, there are different things will grow. But it's just gra just dirt, nothing grew yet. When the rain comes, then it all starts to come up, or everything comes out with the rain. So, sinful desires, they all come up, but they can all be removed by devotional service. And then from the Padma Purana, four stages of sin are vanquished. What are the four stages of sin? Yes? What are the four stages of sin? Bija. Huh? Bija. Bijam. And what's the pri stage before Bijam? Kutam. Kutam, Bijam, then? Papam. Huh? Papam. Papam. Papam, sinful activities. Aparabdha, unmanifest. Aparabdha, yeah, Kutam, Bijam, Aparabdha. Parabda, something like that. Let's see. Bija, material desires, right? The story of Ajamil, very interesting. You know the story of Ajamila from the sixth canto? Ajamila was a Brahmana when he was a young man, but he became very degrading. He became very sinful and he he left his wife, he had a very nice chaste wife, but he gave her up and he went off, he had met this, he seen this other woman who was a drunkard and she was a low class woman, but somehow this Ajamila, he left his wife and he brought this other woman who was a drunkard, he brought her to his home and he started to associate with her and he, he, he just rejected his wife and just associated with this other woman. And he, they were, he was very old and they were still having children. And he gave the youngest son the name Narayan. So at the time of death, when Ajamila was dying, the Yamaduras came. The Yamaduras mean servants of Yamaraj. And they were very horrible. They came with ropes and they came to get Ajamila. They were going to take him to Yamaraj for punishment. So Yamaraj was, Ajamila was very afraid 
because he saw these men and he saw they were horrible looking and they were very angry and they were taking him, come on you, you, you sinful man, we're going to take you to Yamaraj, he's going to punish you for all the nonsense you've done. So Ajamila was really afraid and he was calling for his son, he was calling, Narayan, Narayan, Narayan. He was calling the name of his son, his son had been given his son the name Narayan, the name of the Lord. So the Yamad, when he called the name Narayan, the Vishnu Duras came, the servants of Lord Vishnu came and they told the Yamaduras, you cannot take this man. And they said, why not? He's very sinful. They said, no, he has chanted the holy name of the Lord. So all of his sins, all taken away. Now when he was calling the name, he was calling for his son. He wasn't calling for the Lord. But because his son had the name of the Lord, he got the benefit of calling the Lord's name. So that destroyed all of his sins. It didn't make him a pure devotee, but it, it saved him from going to hell. And he got a second chance. So that Bijam, material desires, the story of Antonila. He had the desire. Then the two examples, the venereal disease, the elephant bathing, they don't counteract sinful reactions. But chanting the holy name counteracts. Avidya, ignorant, yes? Well, they chant the holy name. Yeah, of course, they don't have so much love for Krishna, but they have the faith to chant the holy name. So that's good. Why are they chanting the holy name? Okay. They can learn more about how to improve their chanting. But their chanting is very good. Their chanting, even though they have some material motive behind their chanting, because their chanting is very good. And they can get the association of devotees who can instruct them how to avoid the offenses in chanting. You know the offenses in chanting? Huh? No, no. Ten offenses in chanting the holy name. You know that? No? Shafan? Huh? Yeah? Yeah, blaspheme the devotees who dedicated their lives to propagating the holy name. No, no, not exactly. You know, you 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 don't know one ma. You hit me in Jomma. First offense, to blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their lives to propagating the holy name. Second offense? Names of demigods, like Lord Shiva or Lord Brahma, to be equal to or are independent of the holy name of Lord Vishnu. That's an offense. If you consider chanting names of demigods, it's not equal to or independent of the name of Lord Vishnu. Number three. Disobey the instruction of spiritual master. Number four. Disobeying the instructions of the scriptures. To disobey the this the 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 the
our literature in pursuance of the Vedic version. To blaspheme the Vedic literature or any literature in pursuance of the Vedic version. So we should not criticize any of the Vedic literature. Number five. No? Yes, five. Huh? Yes, to consider glories of chanting Hare Krishna to be imagination. Number six, to give some interpretation of the holy name. Number seven, you don't know either, eh? Ten offenses. To commit sinful activities. Yes, to commit sinful... One may think, Oh, there's a party tonight. I'll go to party. Maybe we'll drink. Maybe we'll smoke. Tomorrow I'll chant Hare Krishna. Make up. I'll chant two rounds extra tomorrow to make up for my sinful life. So that's an offense. If you think we can counteract sinful activities by chanting. Number eight. To consider chanting Hare Krishna. Offered in the Vedas as karma kanda, fruit of activity. Number nine, to instruct faithless persons about the glories of the holy name. Number ten, to not have complete faith in the chanting of the holy name and to maintain right. We try to say these ten offenses every morning before japa. It's in the nectar of devotion. The ten offenses are printed there inside the nectar of devotion. You can find it. In a little while, we'll come to it. You'll see. All right, so avidya ignorance. Uh, Ignorance, they were compared to, what? How, how was the ignorance removed? What was the example? Snakes. The snakes, right? What happens? In the forest fire, the snakes get burned. So in the fire of devotional service, the snakes are removed, right? And then Padma Purana analogy, well that's the snakes, right? What was Srimad Bhagavatam 422? I forget that one now. Ignorance. Sanat Kumar. False ego. It's like a, a rope. But the devotees can easily cut through that knot. Okay? There's some references. Devotional service. The best means of obtaining relief from distress, right? We're talking about Klesh Agni. Relief from distress. So the best means of obtaining relief from distress. Devotional service, therefore, has the power to actually nullify all kinds of reactions to sinful deeds. Even you're a killer of your family, or you, you do the most sinful thing, the most sinful, horrible thing, you can get free from the sinful reactions by devotional service. This is the power. It doesn't matter what sin you've done. You may be a murderer or a killer, you know, kill, you're really a really sinful person, but you can, if you surrender to Krishna, you can get free from sinful reactions. The desire seed can be removed only by Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness is so strong, snakes of ignorance are immediately killed. It is the only process that can counteract all three causes. What are the three causes? All three causes, remember three causes of suffering? Three causes of sickness. First of all, 
ignorance, the root, material desires, yes, good, very good. Okay, objectives, overview of six characteristics, and at what stage they manifest, who remembers? Okay, what symptoms manifest at Sadhana Bhakti? What? Ah, look at the notes. Uh, <laughs> yes? Beginning of all auspiciousness and relief from material distress, yes. And then, Bhava Bhakti, what manifests? Meaning? Huh? Yeah, derives liberation. Liberation is insignificant to a devotee. Doesn't mean has no meaning to him. And then, rarely achieved. Right, rarely achieved. And what else is there when he's doing Baba Bhakti? Only two. The other two are what? Huh? Agni, Subhada. Huh? All right. And tell me then, Prima Bhakti, Mandaji, characteristics, what's there in Prima Bhakti? Krishna Karshini, meaning? The only way to attract Krishna. Yeah. Uh huh. And Sandra Nanda Vishesh Atma, meaning? Huh? Transcendental, the highest transcendental bliss. And what else is there? Yes? What else is there? What other ca characteristics are there in Prima Bhakti? Is there in there? No. No, what's there? Remember, two from the two from Sadhana and the four from Baba, and then the six characteristics in Prima. So all the characteristics are in Prima. So do you remember all six characteristics now? Yeah? What are they? No, we do not get rid of material design. Side in the bhakti, we had the two characteristics were klesh atni and subhada, meaning? Yes, beginning of all auspiciousness and relief from material distress. Distress, yes. And then Baba Bhakti. No, we're not. It means we don't deride. We deride the concept of liberation. We're not interested in liberation. And. To do Laba. Rarely achieved. So you want to remember these things, you have to memorize this. And then, Klesh Agni. What does it mean, Momo? Klesh Agni. Klesha means what? Klesha means Klesha means distress, right? And Agni ni means to get free from distress. 
the Klesh Agni, relief from, to get free from distress, relief from distress. So we spoke about four kinds of effects of sin. Four kinds of effects of sin. Okay, yeah. And devotional service has the power to nullify all kinds of simple reactions with appropriate analogies and Sanskrit verses. Right? We spoke about the different analogies. VD, the elephant, and the snakes, and the false ego, the rope of false ego, these are all different analogies. And we heard the dog eater becomes qualified to perform the Vedic Yagya. Devotional service, the best means to obtain relief from distress. Why? Why is it the best means to get relief from material distress? Yes, Krishna is the Supreme. But actually, devotional service is the best means to get relief. Why? Because it destroys the beach. Yes, it takes even the desire for sin is taken away. We don't just counteract the cause of the suffering. But we take away even the desire to do more suffering. That is the superior position of bhakti yoga. Is it clear? Hmm? Concluding quote. My material contamination is very subtle. It's beginning its fruition and results, and how one suffers such results in the form of distress are part of a great chain. When one catches some disease, it is often very difficult to ascertain the cause of the disease. The practical injection is to stop all the fructifications of the seeds of our sinful activities. Simply engagement in Krishna consciousness. So the injection, there are people like here, they're talking about COVID and the different injections. Should we get the China injection? Should we get the Russian injection? You know, what injection do we want? We want the injection of Krishna consciousness. That is the best injection. Right? Simply engagement in Krishna consciousness. Okay, we're not finished yet. <laughs> Hang on. Papam. Aparabda palam papam. Kutam bijam palan mukam. Kramanaiva prana. Raliya eta. Vishnu bhakti. Okay. So aparabda. Aparabda meaning not manifest yet. The effect which is almost mature. It's not yet mature, it's almost mature. Palam, palam the fruit or the result, and papam the sin or the vices. Kutam, it's like the germ. Kutam is a germ, the effect which is not yet fructified. And bijam, the seed. The effect which is lying is seed. So kutam is first and then the bijam, you get the seed. And then the seed that grows, then you get the falam mukam. Falam mukam, the current, the effect which is already mature. Kramina, gradually, eva also. Praliyeta, it will be vanquished. Vishnu bhakti. Ratatmanam. One who takes pleasure in devotional service to Lord Vishnu. Persons who are completely engaged in the devotional service of Lord Vishnu, the personality of Godhead, become completely extinct from all sorts of vicious reactions 
either potential germinating, seedling, or current by a gradual process. So that is Vishnu Bhakti, power of devotional service, that all the different stages of the sin, the Kutam, the Bijam, the Parabdha, the Aparabdha, can all be removed by devotional service. Right? Believe me? No? The vices in their different stages of development are analyzed herein. Palamukam, vice, is that which we may be undergoing at the present stage of life. Meaning? What's the, at the present stage of life? We may be suffering. We may be, you know, we're very unhealthy, we're very poor, uneducated, not very good looking like that. This is our palamukam. Bijam, vice, is in the seedling process by our desire of different types. The seed. And kutam is prior to the stage of bijam. bijam. That is in the germinating stage. Aparabdha, the fount fountain source of all. And from this storehouse of vicious life, all other stages develop. And all these stages of vicious life become at once switched off by adoption of devotional service. So, Aparabdha, the fountain of all of the different stages. So, all removed. Aparabdha, Kutam, Bijam, Parabdha, they're all removed by devotional service. Okay, finished. Any questions? The Papa Beej. The pap, Papa, not the Bhakti Lata Beej, but the Pap Lata Beej. Papa, la, Papa Lata Beej. <laughs> Papa Lata. Uh, yes. Okay. Sim. The point is, Bhakti Lata Beej is going to the lotus feet of Krishna, taking shelter there. But the Pap Lata, that is just going endlessly round and round. You know, you go round and round. Some you take birth and die, different demonic species of life. Sometimes you may come up, you enjoy some pious activity, then you go down. You're in the wheel. You never go anywhere. Right? You never get anywhere with that kind of... Yes, someone chants jokingly or inattentively. Well, you have to consider if it's Namabhas or Nam Aparad. You see, if somebody is chanting Nam Aparad, then they don't get that. But if he's chanting it's Namabhas, just like Ajamil, his chanting was Namabhas. Because when Ajamil chanted the name of his son, he was not thinking that I'm calling the name of the Lord and I will get free of my sinful reactions. 
he didn't have that intention and he didn't know that. So similarly, somebody is chanting and now they're chanting, you say jokingly, uh, with, with no, not much attention, so do they get freed of their sinful reactions? Well, you have to consider what is their what is their mood in chanting? Is, are they chanting? Is it offensive chanting or not? Are they following the order of the spiritual master? Do they have faith in the holy name? You have to consider what is their attitude. Why are they chanting jokingly like that? Why are they not serious? So to get rid of sinful reactions, this is not the real business of devotional service. Right? We don't just chant Hare Krishna only to get rid of sinful reactions. We want to chant to get love for Krishna. So, yeah, you just want to get rid of sinful reactions, then you can do other processes, you can do many things. You can do the Jnana Kanda. Jnana Kanda can also get you rid of sinful reactions. Even Karma Kanda, even some Priyastit can get you rid of sinful reactions. But it doesn't take away the desire for sin. Right? The desire for sin is still there. So you may get rid of sinful reactions, but they didn't get rid of the desire for sin because they didn't chant the name properly. So Ajamila, his chanting was Namabhas. He got rid of sinful reactions, but then he had to go to hard work. He went to Hardwar and he stayed in the Vishnu temple and he got purified. Then he went back to God. So you have to get rid of the desire from the heart. Okay, any other questions? Yes, Prabhu? How we can increase this desire to change properly and get Shudanam and get out of Anamapara? How to get through Nama Parad and chant properly? How to improve the quality of your chanting? Yes, increase this desire. Increase that desire. Well, more chanting. More chanting. Practice makes perfect. So chant more and serve the devotees. Mahat Sevam Dwara Mahur Vimuktis. Serve the devotees, very powerful. The devotees will bless you with the blessings of the devotees, then you can get that taste for the holy name. So. Anything? Well, generally the, the pure devotee, his duty is to give Krishna consciousness. His duty is not just to save people from their sinful reactions. So the pure devotee wants to engage people in Krishna's service. He will, he will teach them how to serve Krishna. But to get rid of their sinful reactions, that's up, up to the, devote, the person themselves. Are they going to stop sinning? Are they ready to give up sinful activities? If they're going to keep sinning, then they have no business to come and ask the pure devotee to get rid of their sinful reactions. They have to want to stop sin. And if they come and take blessings from the pure devotee and then continue to sin, then it's very bad. So Prabhupada did not like to give, he, he, 
usually devotees of Lord Chaitanya and Prabhupada, when you bless people, you simply bless them, may you always be in Krishna consciousness. I bless you, Krishna Matir Vashtu. May your mind always be on Krishna. That is the blessing devotees give to other people. We don't want to give any other blessings. We simply want to bring people to Krishna consciousness. Yes, Vasudev Datta said like that. Huh? That was Prahlad Maharaj's mood like that also, concerned with compassion for others. But we're more realistic. We want, yeah, we want to bring them to Krishna, but we, we don't want to bring sinful people to Krishna. They're going to go to Krishna, they should be qualified. Hmm? You bring a bunch of sinful people to Krishna, Krishna will think, what kind of people are these you brought to me? Useless people, they're not ready to surrender, not ready to be my devotees. Why you bring them to me? Better leave them in the material world. So they have to be ready to go to Krishna. Hmm? Hare Krishna. All right, so we're going to go on tomorrow. We'll finish this uh, surrender, this uh, chapter one, the second part to it. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Everybody's email.